If you've had a chance to tour the inside of George Passfield's former residence, you already know the artful craftsmanship and architectural detail. Its classical design was meant to impress, and nowhere is that more obvious than here in the main entrance hall. Here again is architectural historian Anthony Rubano. We were talking outside about the classical revival style and the symmetry and formality. Well, you come in this beautiful front door into this grand entrance hall, mm -hmm. and this would have been where guests were received. So one steps into this hall and sees these beautiful columns here, two fully round columns, ionic columns, mm -hmm. and then two pilasters, as we call them when they're squared off, that are engaged into the wall. So it creates almost a colonnade here mm -hmm. that divides this entrance where we're standing now from the staircase itself. Certainly a very bold move, a very grand move, to have these large columns that are archaeologically correct, in other words, they are perfectly proportioned. Mm -hmm. Having these columns in this space really speaks to a grandeur and a formality. So we know that this, these, this is meant to impress. Mm -hmm. This room is certainly meant to impress. The wainscoting that's around the room, beautiful paneling with, with very nice reveals and molding, taken up the staircase too, again, meant to impress. This was not inexpensive. Mm -hmm. This was all hand done and hand fitted together. Um, and even the, the inset panels in between the molding have a beautiful uh, graining to them. This sort of figuring that uh, is repeated in all of the inset panels mm -hmm. around the room and up the stairs. So our eye is carried up the stairs mm -hmm. by, this, by the graining itself. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful banister with these very delicately turned balusters um, that, that just have such an elegance to them. And so our eye is drawn to all of this beautifully figured wood, beautifully crafted wood, the gilt capitals um, as we see up at the tops of these columns. So all of this was intended to, to impress mm -hmm. us, the visitors, and to make this house seem very grand, of course it was, so the craftsmanship that we're seeing here was meant for the visitors, in a sense. Uh, this was a time yeah. when people would call on each other and everyone would have a calling card and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. It's mm -hmm. that sort of Victorian propriety that was going on. And so people were received here. And this is the first interior space they would be familiar with. And of course, it had to knock their socks <laughs> off to a certain extent. And the floors are quarter sawn oak, which is um, beautiful and relatively typical of the day for a, a very, very nice house. Mm -hmm. So. When you get this display of, of woodwork at eye level and ground level, then our eye rises to a beautiful plaster cornice uh, against the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this was meant to impress as well. Um, the cornice itself is of plaster, and it is an archaeologically correct or relatively so um, classical uh, cornice with medallions and dentals and so forth. Mm -hmm. So these words, these Latin words that were developed to describe all of these little elements speaks to how correct it was supposed to be. You know, mm -hmm. if you were a designer who knew what you were doing, you'd have pattern books that spelled all this out. And so that correctness that kind of was uh, not imported, but um, was fell into favor in the mid 1890s, uh, replaced an eclecticism as we talked about outside. And so we're seeing it played out in all the details in the interior as well. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just grand moves like creating a colonnade in the room, but all the way down to the details where we're supposed to notice this correctness, this elegance and symmetry. If we leave this parlor, the, the entry hall, and move into what would have been originally, I think, the dining room, mm -hmm. um, we also see that now the, the grandness doesn't stop in the parlor. No, no. Because what you've got then, of course, there, there were many fireplaces in the house, mm -hmm. but the mantles in the fireplaces make a statement to them. Absolutely. And these are mini buildings almost. I mean, when you see the size of this mantle with the four round columns there defining this beautiful thing, it speaks to us as a piece of architecture mm -hmm. itself. And this was the dining room. This was also a formal space. This was where people would be entertained. And there were actually a series of formal rooms in, typically, in typical large houses, parlors, sometimes two parlors, one for the men, one for the women, mm -hmm. after the dinner was over, the dining room itself. And they all were meant to sort of continue that um, propriety, elegance, symmetry. Sometimes the, the men's parlor was a little bit more masculinely designed and the women's parlor was a, was a little bit more feminine. In other words, the color selection was different. There'd be leather in the men's parlor, there'd be more chintz in the women, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But generally, architecturally, there was still that overriding sense of formality. And by this period, when this house was constructed, 
the classical style was coming in, so there was a symmetry and a reliance on classical motifs. And we can see that in this fireplace. We talked about it as a miniature piece of architecture. Well, it is. The columns are miniatures of that which we saw mm -hmm. in the entrance parlor. Yep. The molding around the fireplace itself, and I'm just going to go point to it because mm -hmm. I can't keep myself from touching these beautiful <laughs> things. The molding that comes down and around and in, see how it comes in here like this? That's oh. actually a classical motif that's oh. called an eared architrave. And we don't see this so much in Victorian uh, eclectic uh, architecture, but the classical times bringing in classical elements, uh, this would be how the top of a doorway would be detailed mm -hmm. while they applied it to a fireplace. So we have this eared architrave that helps tell us that this is more of a classical piece mm -hmm. of, of design. The bead and reel molding that happens here, more dentals, and all of this is in a beautifully figured quarter sawn oak. So the wood here has changed from the entry, mm -hmm which is relatively common. There'd be a series of woods in different rooms, sometimes maple, walnut, oak in this case, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And it was because these woods were available and they were very rich and uh, uh, heavily figured and grained. And so it was a chance to display that kind of material difference. And so each room had a, a subtlety in, a, in addition to this you know, beautiful, bold move. The um, tiles here around the fireplace are incredibly smooth. They have a beautiful um, um, feel to them. Unglazed tile. Oh, yeah. you know, I, it has I a very velvety, was, a yeah, very velvety very feel. Smooth. And, and uh, if you notice, each of the tiles as it goes across the top are cut at a slightly different angle. It's called a splayed arch or a jack arch. Very difficult to do mm -hmm. because each one has, is, is different than every other tile in that, mm -hmm. in that header. Um, but typical of the 1880s, 90s. There was still that sense of material and fine craftsmanship, but here it is in a, a, a classical sense, yeah. um, whereas 10 years prior, we'd see similar beautiful tile work, but with a very elaborate aesthetic movement fireplace around it. So there, we can still see when exactly this was built based on the materials and style, but we also know this is now the classical era, Beaux-Arts classicism replacing eclecticism from the mm -hmm. previous generation. Anthony, thank you. Well, you're quite welcome.